So, good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce Martin Lévy from the University of Picardie, Jules Verne, Namia, who will give today one of the first of three lectures on smooth robotic theory. So, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, it's a great honor to, to be given the opportunity to give this mini course. Uh, so my, my goal will be to, to give some general introduction to smooth ergodic theory, and this may be complementary to previous lectures, in particular uh, John's. Uh, so I, I'll probably refer to some of the results you mentioned. Uh, so let me start. Um, so uh, the the setting we are going to consider is uh, so we work with a uh, M uh, compact Riemannian connected uh, manifold uh, without boundary. And the dynamics we are going to consider is that of a map F acting on M uh, of a certain high regularity, so class CK, preserving orientation. And in 99% uh, of what I'm going to say is going to be actually a diffeomorphism. But maybe uh, if I have time, maybe I'll mention one argument, which, which will be in the case of uh, endomorphisms. So just to, to, um, to have a global frame for all those, uh, let, let's just consider the case where our map satisfies this condition. So in particular, it's going to be a local diffeomorphism of a certain degree. Okay. So it's, uh, the thing is this uh, manifold with a certain uh, smooth dynamics. Then uh, ergodic theory uh, is interested in describing the statistical behavior of orbits. So uh, when you follow the time evolution of a point. And in particular, uh, one way to, to make this a bit uh, more precise is to consider uh, time averages over a certain trajectory. So you start with a point X, you consider its iterates, and you form the, the average of the Dirac masses uh, over uh, the, the first points in the orbits. Okay, so this gives you a sequence of probability measures. And you wonder to what extent this uh, sequence of measures is going to uh, con converge actually in weak star topology to a certain measure. Okay, so this measure, a priori, if it exists, uh, it may depend on the point x you chose, and maybe different points will exhibit very different types uh, of behaviors. Okay, so in particular, if this holds, uh, so if you have this uh, weak star convergence then uh, you have uh, some relation to uh, the classical uh, Boltzmann um, uh, uh, setting where you, you want to compare temporal averages and space averages. So uh, looking at the action of this uh, probability measure on certain functions, so looking at, at the dual uh, version of that. Uh, so if you, you start with a test function pi, then uh, applying these measures to phi will give you these uh, temporal averages. Okay? And in that case, where you have conversion to the measure mu, then those temporal, temporal averages are going to converge to special averages. So uh, the average of your function test function phi with respect to the measure mu. Okay? So uh, that's uh, one way to, to make it precise what we understand by behavior of orbits. And uh, so in, in the case where uh, those uh, averages, uh, so uh, temporal averages are going actually to converge to a certain measure, then we may further uh, uh, look at uh, what's the properties of this measure. So uh, one property I'm going to focus on in particular during these lectures is ergodicity. So some kind of indecomposability in terms of measures. So uh, when you have an invariant set, it's trivial in the sense of measures. So uh, Either, it's either measure zero or full measure. Okay. Uh, further properties uh, that were also mentioned in various lectures here, like mixing and so on, but I'm not going to insist on, on that. So let me skip the, the definition. Yeah. And uh, so if we go back to our uh, initial question, so there we were fixing a point and looking at uh, the convergence of these uh, temporal averages. We can do a slightly different uh, in a slightly different way. So uh, first consider the set of uh, Borel probability measures uh, preserved by your map. Okay. So in case our manifold is compact, you know, it's, this set is always non-empty. And uh, so we may pick one of, one of such measures and uh, look for the set of points which will actually follow the statistics of mu. So uh, going back to temporal averages, 
uh, it means that the temporal averages starting at x will converge and we start to predict to the measure mu which we fixed. And this uh, uh, will denote uh, that property uh, uh, just saying that x belongs to the basin of our measure mu. Okay, so the, the basin is precisely the points which follow the statistics of the measure mu which we fixed when you go forward. Now, um, so going uh, about that question, there is some some first answer given by Bokov theorem, uh, which was already mentioned by John. Then um, uh, Bokov theorem tells you that. Uh, uh, so when you fix a text function in L1, then uh, the temporal averages uh, here are going to converge uh, to certain function phi star with good properties. Okay? So still in L1, this uh, uh, function phi star is invariant by the dynamics and has the same average as the initial test function you, which you fixed. Okay? So that's the general framework. And uh, in particular, when our system is ergodic, this invariance here implies that uh, the limit uh, function phi star is actually a constant function. And due to that, uh, uh, the fact that they are the same average as phi, then it means that, in fact, it's um, almost everywhere equal to the average of phi. OK, so that's the particular case where the system is ergodic. OK, so what does it say in terms of our uh, previous problem? So it says that uh, our uh, temporal averages are going to converge to uh, the average of pi with respect to mu, which means precisely that almost every x is in the basin of mu, but almost in terms of the measure mu which we fixed. But maybe this measure mu is very specific uh, and uh, doesn't see so many points. Uh, so it's, it's satisfactory, but uh, we would like to understand better if you pick a point at random, so typically with respect to Lebesgue measure, What's the behavior of no point? Okay, so that's a very satisfactory uh, result. But we want to, to go more in the direction of when uh, you can uh, actually observe uh, the statistics of a point uh, when you, you pick a point at random. Okay. Then, uh, so this is related with the notion of physical measure, which I recall here. So uh, we may wonder when there exists. Uh, an open set in the support of our measure, such that uh, almost uh, uh, so almost every point uh, in your open set uh, will be in the basin of mu. But almost here means with respect to the natural uh, Lebesgue measure, which is on your your manifold, which I will denote throughout the lectures by m. So typically, mu will be an invariant measure, and m will be the Riemannian volume in, in my lecture notes, just to, to make distinction. So now we want to, to understand what's the size of the basin with respect to that natural uh, Lebesgue measure. Okay. So in case we have this uh, this uh, thing that uh, we can uh, have a positive Lebesgue measure set of points following the, the statistics of mu, then uh, we'll, we'll speak about physical measures. So just for concreteness, let me give some examples. So one natural example is the case where your system is conservative. So when it preserves a certain measure uh, mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to m, so the Riemannian volume with positive density on uh, some open set u, then by Birkhoff theorem, it, uh, we know that uh, we have that condition. So uh, m, almost every point in our open set, will satisfy, uh, will be in the base. Okay, so the, the conservative case uh, is uh, one one case which uh, enters in that framework when you have a good city. And uh, another uh, situation, which is a, a dissipative one. Uh, so, for example, we can consider the case of a sink. So when uh, X is a sink, so it attracts uh, a neighborhood. So in particular, all the points around are going to be very close to X eventually. And... Uh, so when we look at uh, temporal averages, essentially everything will be concentrated uh, near x. And it means uh, for our problem that uh, the direct mass at x is a physical measure. So that's another example in dissipative situation. A slightly more refined example is the case of a figure eight attractor like that. <coughs> so here you have an eight uh, doing that uh, type of uh, 
dynamics and orbits uh, near your eight are going to wrap around closer and closer in the inside, in the outside, in the inside, they are going uh, to spiral like, like that, closer and closer to the boundary. So in particular, you see that everything is going to concentrate on your eight, but uh, the dynamics restricted to the, the eight is actually uh, wandering. I mean, everything is con converging to the, the point B. So uh, we see, in fact, here is the same thing that uh, uh, all the forwards orbits, uh, I mean, the statistics is going to, to concentrate near P and same thing, uh, the direct mass at P is going to be physical here as well. Okay, so that's, those are three natural examples of physical measures. Okay, so uh, just uh, for a brief, a very brief history of a uh, smooth ergodic theory. So maybe it started with uh, the work of Hadamar and Hopf, where they, they were studying the geodesic flow in negative uh, curvature. So it's uh, concrete examples of a uh, uh, of systems and they, they uh, in particular they uh, hope uh, introduce an argument uh, which is very powerful to prove ergodicity and which i'm which is one of the goals of what i want to say so eventually i want to, to give this argument uh, in the general case of uh, uh, hyperbolic systems uh, so that, that that was the uh, first uh, work maybe in this direction and uh, so uh, going to our previous question, so understanding the statistic the, of the points, then uh, uh, in the 50s, people started to realize that there were obstructions to ergodicity uh, by the work of Kolmogorov and Arnold and Moser, which, uh, which is now referred to KM Purin, which was uh, mentioned by Frank. Uh, the sorry? The yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, so then in a fully general framework, when you study just a diffeomorphism, then uh, there are obstructions to ergodicity due to many, uh, many uh, I mean, persistence of invariant curves and so on. Okay, so in this general framework, you cannot hope to, to, to have uh, uh, generally uh, ergodicity, but still, we, if you restrict your class to a, a smaller one, uh, namely hyperbolic systems, which uh, uh, were a first study, for example, in the work of Anosov, and C9 in the 60s, then uh, ergodicity may uh, uh, may still be possible to be shown. So the, 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 there's their work in hyperbolic uh, situation, which I'm going to introduce uh, in, a, in a minute. And uh, so their uh, statistics uh, is well understood. And, uh, and later on, uh, people uh, introduced uh, broader classes of dynamical systems where still uh, ergodicity uh, may be uh, reasonable to expect. So uh, two uh, generalizations of hyperbolic systems are uh, so the partially hyperbolic systems, which I'm going to, to also mention, and uh, non-uniformly hyperbolic ones when uh, you have non-uniformity of the hyperbolic system. Okay, but uh, that I'm not going to, to mention. So the, I, I gave a list of uh, names of pioneers in that field, but there are many more, in, of course. <laughs> so going back to uh, uh, our question, so uh, there is a quite a different behavior uh, when your system con is conservative or not. So as, as we saw there, for example. Um, so let me just recall what this means. Uh, uh, so in the general framework which I introduced, so when your um, when you are map F satisfies this non-degeneracy condition, then uh, it always preserves the Riemannian um, class, this, the, the the, the class of the measure uh, of the Riemannian volume M, which means that uh, when you push uh, this measure by the dynamics, just by the uh, uh, change of variables, then uh, it's still something uh, in the class of the, the measure M. So when you, you do some finite number of iterations, then you preserve this class of measures. But it doesn't mean that uh, there is an invariant measure in that class. Okay? So that's essentially the, the distinction between conservative and dissipative. So conservative systems are those for which there is actually an invariant measure in that class, and dissipative systems are those which are not like that. So uh, uh, any invariant measure with full support has, is going to have some singular part with respect to them. Okay, so this, uh, this dichotomy, so uh, uh, in the first uh, part of the, uh, the, I mean, when I refer to off argument and so on, I, I, 
concentrate on conservative systems. But later on, if I have time, I'll try to, to say how will you replace uh, uh, volume for dissipative systems. And still, uh, there is a way to describe the statistics of a large number of orbits, even for those. So, uh, something, something seems to be wrong. Yeah, and that one? Yeah, there's no why in the expression. Yeah, sorry, it should be why. This one be why. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So, okay, so just uh, between conservative and dissipative, so uh, the conservative may seem a very restricted class, but still, I mean, there are many interesting uh, systems in that class. So uh, one such type of dynamics is uh, given by Hamiltonian dynamics, which may describe, for example, billiards, like that figure. So you start with a point, take an angle, uh, follow the straight line until you hit the boundary again, uh, then reflect elastically and follow the trajectory again and again. So the other geodesic flows, also the motion of planets is described by that framework. So it's a very large class of systems with, with a lot of uh, and very rich and interesting behavior. And uh, so just to recall uh, the Hamiltonian uh, setting, so we, we start with a manifold, say R to the two N, for example, endowed with that uh, two form. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the dynamics which we put is uh, given some Hamiltonian H. So we may consider the, the flow associated to the vector field F satisfying this equation. Uh, which can be also written in this, in this way with uh, so the Hamiltonian equations. And uh, so uh, in, that class, in that class, uh, there is always a preserved, preserved uh, volume, which is the Uville measure. So uh, just uh, from the definition, uh, the dynamics preserves uh, the omega form. And uh, in particular, it preserves uh, I mean the, the volume uh, associated to that form will be uh, uh, invariant measure. Okay, so that's a very broad class of systems uh, with conservative behavior. On the other side of the spectrum, so let's look at a specific example of dissipative systems. So uh, we consider uh, certain dynamics on the circle, uh, so of north, north pole, uh, south pole type. So it means that uh, all the orbits um, are going to drift from one fixed point. Um, so starting close to uh, the north pole, which is a repelling fixed point. Uh, I mean, all the other points are going to drift uh, uh, closer and closer to the south pole, which is an attracting fixed point. Okay, so we, we look at that type of dynamics in the circle, and uh, I claim uh, it's a dissipative map. Uh, so why? I mean, just to, to go back to our definition, we have to check that uh, any uh, fully supported measure has some singular part. So if um, uh, delta s uh, there, uh, so the, the direct mass is clearly an invariant measure, uh, it's, it's physical, it's uh, in the framework of uh, things which I was mentioning. Uh, but let's look at another measure mu, uh, which gives zero mass to s and a positive mass to the, the complement. So in particular, we may take a neighborhood i, so it's uh, interval i, uh, which is neighborhood of the north pole with positive mass. So what we see is just by the definition of the dynamics, when you look at three images of I, they are going to contract to, to be closer and closer to. So if I was that part there, then uh, F minus one of I is going to be like that and so on. So they, they contract closer and closer to the North Pole. And eventually the intersection of all, all of them, sorry, is going to just be the North Pole. But uh, the measure of this intersection at finite time, uh, I mean, it's a decreasing intersection, so it's just going to be f to the minus n i. By, but by, con uh, by the fact that mu is invariant, the measure of this thing is just the measure of the interval i you start with, which is positive. So in particular, going to the limit as the, so when n goes to infinity, we see that the measure of the North Pole is going to uh, to be positive. So all the measures of full support are going, uh, are going to either give positive weight to S or positive weight to N. Okay, so it's uh, so an example of dissipatis. So now uh, let me just uh, introduce some tools um, 
for the, the following, which uh, uh, we use uh, several times. So um, there's first the notion of dominated splitting. So uh, if you consider uh, so you, your system L and invariant set lambda, we say that it has dominated splitting. If you can split uh, the tangent space restricted to uh, lambda into several subspaces, uh, and uh, these subspaces have to have constant dimension as you change the point, uh, they satisfy some sort of invariance. So uh, they, they are invariant by the tangent dynamics. So when you take a vector in the i uh, space in your splitting and you map it by the differential, it's going to be mapped to a vector in the i space at the image point. Okay, so you have this invariance uh, by the infinitesimal dynamics. And uh, dominated means that you have this domination. That's the growth uh, is uh, different on each of the subspaces. So more precisely, it means that <coughs> The maximal expansion you see on the i subspace is going uh, to be smaller and exponentially smaller than the minimal uh, expansion you see on the next one. Okay, so you have this dominated domination there. Will you assume some continuity or something? Uh, I, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are going to be continuous actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this is the notion of dominated splitting. And uh, one way to check that is uh, through cone fields. So cone fields, uh, uh, roughly speaking, is just an assignment of cones uh, to each point uh, x. So you have this map uh, from the invariant set lambda, uh, which, uh, so which to a point x assigns a cone cx. So here I write the cone uh, given by some quadratic form in tangent space. Okay, and uh, we want some continuity of these cones. So this can be uh, said just saying that taking local charts, your quadratic forms uh, should change uh, continuously. And uh, have uh, always same sign signature, uh, say d plus d minus. Okay, so this is the notion of cone field. So it's basically like that, that at every point you have a certain cone uh, living in the tangent space. And uh, we say that the cone field is contracted if uh, up to a certain iterate. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, it's not contracted right away, but say n is equal to one just for simplicity. Then uh, when you, you map your cone by the tangent dynamics, it will be strictly contained in the image, uh, in the cone at the image point, which is this picture. Basically. So you start with the cone, say, at f minus one of x map it by the differential and the image cone which is the inner one is going to be contained in the interior of the, the cone living at x okay so you have this uh, this uh, contraction of the cone field so now that you have this notion of cone field we can uh, identify the unity splitting through them which is the so-called cone field criterion so if you have a certain uh, compact invariant set uh, and you fix a certain d plus then uh, uh, you have a contracted cone field of dimension d plus, which is the, the d plus here. If and only if there exists a dominated splitting uh, e minus e plus, where the dimension of e plus is uh, this d plus. Okay, so it's basically this picture. Uh, starting with the cone field, how do you produce uh, e plus? You just uh, go, so there I, I was going backwards one time, but if you go backwards n times and apply df to the n, the, the cone field will, will be even more contracted. So you start with something like that, and after n iterations, the cone, the image cone will be extremely thin. And you see that uh, in the limit, it seems reasonable to expect that uh, it defines a unique direction, e plus, which is a uh, one which we wanted in our domain split. And you can look at uh, cone fields in the, in the transverse direction to produce the other direction, E minus, with the, the other reversing time. Okay, so uh, you have this cone field uh, and notion of domain splitting and they interact well. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so now uh, another notion I will rely on in the following is that of foliations and absolute continuity. So let me recall what foliation is. So uh, we say that uh, we have a continuous foliation with C1 leave, 
if you can partition your manifold into some manifolds all of the same dimension, uh, okay, and uh, you have some uh, continuous dependence uh, transversely. So you have basically the, this picture, a stack of some manifolds uh, all of the same dimension, which um, uh, which vary uh, continuously in C1 topology. So when you change uh, from one leaf to the other, the time zone space is going to change continuously. Okay, so th that's uh, what's uh, foliation. And then uh, I'm going uh, to say that it's absolutely continuous if the following holds. So uh, start with such a foliation W and take a local transversal L, like in the picture, to the, the foliation. So this uh, uh, transversal in particular, it allows you to parameterize the set of leaves uh, in the neighborhood. So to each local leaf, you can assign a unique point on the transversal. And um, we say that uh, the foliation is absolutely continuous. If, uh, so there exists a, measure, a measurable family of positive measurable functions F, X, the so-called conditional densities, such that when you look at the measure of a certain uh, set A, you can actually disintegrate it with respect to the uh, 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 to the volume, the remaining volume on the leaves up to a certain density Fx. So it, it means that uh, if you want to integrate, so if you want to look at the measure certain space, uh, sub, uh, measurable subset A, what you can do first is look at the measure of this set on each of the leaves, and then integrate with respect to the, the parameter, uh, leaving, for example, on the transversal. And uh, uh, moreover, when you do that, uh, the, the measure on each of the leaves is going to be essentially the same as uh, uh, remaining volume on the leaves. Okay, so it's uh, the notion of uh, Absolute continuity. When you, you look at the measure on each of the leaves, essentially they behave like Lebesgue. So now, uh, so just uh, a few definitions. So uh, going back to our problem, so uh, the two classes which, which you are going to focus on in the following are um, mostly hyperbolic systems and partially hyperbolic systems. So let me recall what those are. So uh, still uh, working with compact, smooth, uh, remaining manifold. Uh, so we say that a diffeomorphism F is, uh, uh, is hyperbolic if it has dominated splitting, uh, so like I introduced, so the tangent space uh, split into the sum of two bundles, the stable one and the unstable one. And not only uh, it's a dominated splitting, but you have uniform contraction along uh, stable uh, subspace and uniform expansion along unstable subspace. Yeah, sorry. I have a question about the previous slide. Sure. Um, because you didn't, uh, for you, I understand that the foliation already includes in its definition the fact that you have the, you have actually like a canonical chart. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So when you look on the chart, uh, you choose no problem to choose this uh, transversal and then send yeah, it. Exactly. And then in this picture also, this the composition ones, right? So the point here is what? That, uh, Basically, uh, when you have such uh, foliation, what you can do uh, is disintegrate the measure you, which you fix with respect to that foliation. Right. Okay? So if you start with any measure, you can always do that. Yeah. The point is here, if you start with the, the one which I'm especially interested in is the M, so the remaining volume, and I disintegrate, not only I have disintegrations, but those disintegrations behave nicely. So they are essentially Lebesgue also. Possibly your volume, once you disintegrate it, it could be something uh, Singular, it could be direct mass and certain leaves and so on. And um, I don't form that. So absolute continuity says that when you disintegrate your your volume on all the leaves, essentially it's going to be the still the uh, volume on the leaf. So then that's the, the thing. <coughs> okay. So hyperbolicity. So you have this uniform contraction expansion, which means that when you take a vector in stable space and apply the tangent dynamics n times, and it's going to be contracted exponentially, and same dual behavior for unstable vectors. So that's for, for diffeomorphisms. We can have a similar definition in case of flows or semi-flows. Um, it just means that you have to add the direction of the flow, which is in neutral. In that case. So there is a non-contracting, nor expanding direction, which is this one-dimensional 
uh, direction tangent to the flow. Okay, so hyperbolic uh, flows are going to look a bit like that. So uh, you have this stable direction uh, along which points tend to concentrate in the future, and the dual behavior when you take two points which are close uh, but on the unstable direction and they are going to to be spread out uh, by the dynamics. Okay, so uh, the two things that I want to focus on today in the following is. Uh, so the fact that, in fact, these tangent dynamics can be integrated to uh, foliation dynamics. I mean, so uh, these uh, invariant bundles can be integrated to invariant foliations for the dynamics of F. Okay? So unique integrability into so-called stable and unstable foliations. And those foliations are going to be nice. So they are going to vary continuously, even further continuously. I'm not going to show that, but I'm going to focus on the part which is more uh, related to ergodifficulty, which is uh, absolute continuity. So ideally, what I would like to do today is show uh, uh, that they integrate uh, unity and that they, they have this absolute continuity property. OK? And so that's the general definition in the case of an invariant uh, set, which may be a counter set or whatever. But uh, 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 an important class is when the whole manifold is actually in a public set, which is uh, what we call usually an anosov system, so anosov uh, diffeomorphism or an anosov flow. Okay. So that's for hyperbolic systems. And uh, as I was mentioning, there are some generalizations of them. One of them is the notion of partially hyperbolic system, which uh, I now give. So it's very similar, but uh, we weaken one of the assumptions. So it's the uh, same setting. And you say it's partially hyperbolic if, again, there is a dominated splitting, but now in three bundles. So stable and unstable ones are going to have exactly the same type of behavior as previously. So vectors are contracted exponentially or expanding exponentially. But still, there is this intermediate bundle, uh, which has uh, some intermediate type of behavior. So you may have some expansion. You may have some contraction. It may be neutral. But in, a, in any case, it has to be dominated by the other ones, which means that the coefficients uh, uh, giving the expansion or contraction rates along the uh, center are uh, uh, dominated by lambda s and mu u, which are the contraction and expansion along stable and unstable. Okay, so you have this intermediate behavior, which is dominated by the strong hyperbolic directions. So you see, in particular, if EC is zero, then you get a hyperbolic system. And another thing is that if you start with an anode of flow, there was this intermediate uh, direction, and the Taking the time one map of such an analysis of flow will give you naturally a partially hyperbolic system because the center is going to be neutral in that case. Okay. And uh, so uh, the proof I'm going to give is actually working also in this more general setting. So uh, here again, stable and unstable distribution integrate uniquely to invariant foliations, stable and unstable foliations. And again, there are nice properties that are continuous and even absolutely continuous when uh, at least k is marginal. Okay. Uh, still, uh, the center uh, direction has a more pathological behavior. So it may not integrate uniquely to a foliation. And even if it does, usually the foliation is uh, badly behaved. It, it may uh, uh, not have an absolute continuity property or so on. So usually, uh, we, um, most of the time, we try to avoid using uh, such uh, such things and just work with the strong directions. So now uh, let me give some examples of uh, such hyperbolic and partially hyperbolic systems. So uh, I was mentioning the, the uh, pioneering work of Adamar uh, and Hub. So uh, they, they are concerned with the disk flow on negatively curved surfaces. So you start with a point, you fix a unit tangent vector, and you follow the geodesic starting uh, in this direction. And the geodesic flow is just uh, mapping this initial tangent, I mean, vector in unit tangent space to the, uh, the, the one at time t. Okay? So that, that's the, the, the uh, phase space of the geodesic flow here. And this, uh, in the case where your manifold is negatively curved, is going to be uh, anosophic. So that's one very important class of examples. And uh, another one, uh, slightly different, 
Uh, in the case of in the discrete case, is given by uh, hyperbolic toral automorphisms. So one uh, famous example is the one by uh, I, what, what we refer to to the Arnold cat map, which is uh, the following. So you start on T two, and uh, you look at the matrix two one one with integer coefficients and. Uh, determinant one. That map is going to induce naturally uh, a diffeomorphism F A on the two torus. And uh, just by the fact that the, there is one eigenvalue less than one, one larger than one, then this diffeomorphism is going to be another. Okay? And uh, there is just action of uh, that map on the cat. Okay? So it's going to be distorted more and more in the unstable direction. Uh, another example, so those two examples are when the whole manifold is hyperbolic. So another famous, uh, very famous example, when it's not the case, is the so-called Smith's horseshoe. So you, you take, for example, a square, and the dynamics which you consider is, so you map the square to some kind of horseshoe like that, so F of R. And uh, so, uh, uh, so it intersects uh, the initial, uh, uh, square into uh, two, uh, two, uh, two strips here and there. And uh, so uh, you can repeat again and again this construction in the future. And uh, in the limit, you see uh, uh, a bunch of uh, vertical lines going in that direction. So that's going forward. We can do the same going backwards. And it's going to produce in the limit a uh, certain counter <coughs> uh, set of horizontal lines. So in, in the, if you iterate this construction, then we have a bunch of vertical line, a bunch of horizontal lines. And uh, the maximal invariant set, so points which are going to stay forever in the square, correspond to a counter set, which is the intersection of these lines. Okay. So that the set which we produce, the invariant set is going to have this counter structure and is going to be hyperbolic because there you have this vertical direction which is uniformly expanded and this horizontal one which is uniformly contracted. And it's actually a, a very important model because I mean, for, for systems uh, having hyperbolic points, once their manifolds intersect transversely, you can always uh, have this type of behavior. So it's a it's a model for dynamics occurring naturally uh, for a lot of systems. <clears throat> so uh, that's uh, a third example. And uh, ju just to give an example of partially hyperbolic uh, systems. So as I was mentioning, you can take time one map of the of flow. And uh, also, if you know uh, some uh, hyperbolic deformer systems like that one, for example, you can just uh, multiply it with identity or with an isometry, which will produce another direction with uh, uh, which is dominated by the uh, by the base dynamics and uh, given by A, and uh, in that case is is going to be uh, partially public. So just uh, a few examples of the systems which you are going to work on in the forum. So uh, a particular class uh, of uh, hyperbolic sets. Uh, is the um, class of base, basic sets, so those which are transitive, so there is a dense orbit and uh, locally maximal, so you can produce a neighborhood of your set such that uh, the set of points staying forever in you is actually your basic set. Okay, so it's a so called basic set, and uh, one class of basic sets correspond to the so called attractors. So we say it's uh, uh, you have an attractor when there is uh, such a neighborhood of your set which is trapped forward by, by the dynamics. So typically, you have this neighborhood U, and uh, it's going to map to be mapped strictly into its side by the dynamics. So iterating uh, further and further uh, this construction in the limit, you may produce a complicated attractor. So here it's the picture of a picking attractor. Uh, just looking at the, the points. Uh, the intersection of the images of this uh, initial trapping uh, region. Okay, so those attractors have uh, basic properties. So they have local product structure, which means that <clears throat> you can parameterize 
uh, coordinate shots using stable and unstable leaves. So basically, uh, if you look at the neighborhood of any point X in your uh, space, then uh, you can uh, uh, look at this stable leaf. Let's say if Y is a point in this stable leaf, then uh, saturating by the local unstable leaf of Y. So you see that you can reach any point in the neighborhood of X just by that construction. So they, 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 they form a set of coordinates uh, in the, the neighborhood. They have this local product structure. And also another fact is that uh, that tractor is going to be saturated by uh, strong unstable leaves. So once you have a point in the attractor, it's supposed unstable leaf is going to be also contained in the attractor. And uh, uh, also the thing that the, the region you started with is in the uh, contained in the union of the stable manifolds of the points in the attractor. So uh, ah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Oh, no, I was just the content. Yeah, 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 but just uh, saying that uh, maybe uh, it's not the okay. best one. Yeah. yeah, okay, so uh, let me uh, just uh, mention a few basic properties of hyperbolic systems. Uh, and why they are interesting uh, in particular in terms of ergodicity. Uh, uh, so, uh, so these systems are strongly um, uh, depending on initial conditions. There is a strong sensitivity. Uh, for example, I mean, we may look uh, at two points X and Y in the same unstable manifold. And even um, if they are very close, you know that uh, after a small uh, time, they are going to diverge quite fast. So uh, uh, it means that if you do experiments, then uh, a small error uh, initially will, be, uh, will become very large uh, quite, quite soon. So uh, you have this chaoticity. Uh, but still, this, uh, this thing which may be, uh, we may look bad at first, helps to understand the statistical properties. So following the, the orbit of one point is complicated, but understanding the average behavior is, is better. So two things I want to focus on in the following is, so ergodicity uh, for C2 conservative systems, um, hyperbolic systems. So you have this nice uh, description uh, uh, and you play a lot with the, the foliations, as I want to say. And also even in the dissipative setting, you have a replacement for volume, which is the so-called notion of SRB measures uh, in the case of hyperbolic attractors. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what I want to say in the following. And, uh, so these, uh, these systems, although they are very complicated, uh, they may first look uh, very uh, complicated due to this sensitivity to initial conditions. On the statistical point of view, they are quite nice. And another feature of those hyperbolic systems is they are structurally stable. So when you put up a bit the dynamics, it still looks the same, at least on the topological level, <laughs> which is uh, the following uh, result uh, by Anzov. If you take a hyperbolic set, for a certain diffeomorphism, then uh, there exists a neighborhood of f in C1 uh, diffeomorphisms such that any uh, g C1 close to, to f, so any g in that neighborhood is going to also have a hyperbolic set. Okay, so you can produce uh, lambda g, which is going to be hyperbolic for the part of dynamics g. And uh, the dynamics restricted to the Attractor, I mean, sorry, the dynamics restricted to the hyperbolic sets are going to look the same. So there is a topological conjugacy uh, by certain homomorphism HG, which conjugates F to G restricted to the hyperbolic sets. Okay, so you have this nice uh, persistence of the dynamics on uh, at least uh, some part of the dynamics, some properties uh, in particular related to. Uh, Statistical properties may be lost once you, you put up because the conjugacy is just zero, but at least you have some persistence of part of the dynamics. So that's for diffeomorphisms and analogously for flows, you have what we call an orbit equivalence. So when you put up your system, maybe uh, you don't know exactly where to map 
uh, a point because you have some reparameterization along orbits, maybe, but um, but still you know uh, where to map orbits. So you know which orbits you should uh, uh, go for the, the continuation of your system. Okay. So you have structural stability in hyperbolic dynamics. And the uh, last point uh, I wanted to mention is the, for basic sets, so those which are transitive and locally maximal, then you have density of periodic orbits. <laughs> Sorry. So just a, a few basic properties. So now uh, in the in the course uh, and in smooth ergodic theory, um, one uh, feature uh, is that we want to show ergodicity uh, relying strongly on the existence of these smooth objects, uh, uh, in particular the uh, stable and unstable foliations. Okay. So for example, if you want to understand statistical properties, so I just listed two, but there are many more, but uh, so for what we are going to discuss, uh, stable ergodicity is uh, strongly uh, uh, related to uh, properties uh, of the uh, stable and unstable function, in particular absolute continuity. And uh, so in dissipative settings, when we want to consider SRD measures, uh, there again, uh, we strongly use these properties uh, to, show, uh, to understand the statistics of orbits. Okay. Uh, another point is that, so uh, I was uh, speaking mostly about hyperbolic systems, but uh, if you want to consider a broader class, in particular partially hyperbolic ones, then stable and unstable solutions do not span the whole space. You have this missing uh, dimension given by the center space. But as I was saying, usually you don't want to work with that direction. So you want to use only stable and unstable solutions. <laughs> But then, since you are missing a direction, it's not clear how much you can go. So starting from a point X and say putting stable leaf, going to another point Y in stable leaf and then following the stable leaf, and repeating again, stable, unstable, and so on. Uh, how many points can you reach uh, in, in the manifold? So this is... Uh, uh, Somehow some, some sort of transitivity. So if you can reach any other point using stable and unstable arcs, then uh, it gives some transversality of this pair of conditions, which is usually called accessibility. And again, uh, this type of property, so if your conditions have this nice behavior, then this may help you to understand the ergodicity of your system. But I'm not going to have time probably to, to speak about that. But still, I'm, just to, to emphasize that Statistical properties are strongly related with the properties of these invariant foliations, geometric or metric, and so on. <laughs> so now, uh, in the rest of the time uh, today, there are two results I, I want to um, to prove uh, in detail: is the existence of stable foliation and the absolute continuity of them. Okay, so let me start with the stable uh, manifold theorem. So just uh, to, to give a precise formulation. <clears throat> so we fix uh, uh, CR diffeomorphism, uh, and uh, we assume that uh, lambda is F invariant and has a partially hyperbolic splitting. So this may be in particular the case when you have hyperbolic splitting. So hyperbolic splitting yes plus EU is my previous definition, but uh, partially hyperbolic uh, means here that I don't care about whether C, uh, EC may expand or not, it's just dominated, dominating the behavior on EC, yes. So it, if it contracts, it contracts less than ES. Okay. So we have this splitting, and in particular, it, uh, it's a general framework which uh, will contain the hyperbolic systems. Okay. But still, I want ES to be uniformly contracted. Yeah, EC, I don't care. Then, uh, for uh, such systems, we define uh, the strong stable set, so uh, as follows, so if you fix a point X in your uh, F invariant set, the strong stable uh, manifold through X, uh, by definition, is a set of points Y, such that the points uh, uh, in the future are going to uh, satisfy this, uh, this thing that uh, if, for example, EC is, uh, has some contracting directions, they are going to, to, to get closer then the minimal, I mean, the, the expansion given by EC. 
Okay, so they, they are going to be exponentially uh, closer to what they should be if they were uh, on EC, uh, if EC is contracted first. So they, they get close uh, in a, a dominated way with respect to EC direction. It's correct. Yeah. Yeah. You just told me my contraction. Minimal contraction backwards. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Bigger than contraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. No, no, it doesn't matter. So, for example, basically, let's just give two, two, two cases. So, if EC, for example, if EC is contracting but less contracting. Stop, stop. Yeah. If EC is contracting but less contracting than yes, then uh, you are going to be closer than what we should be uh, on EC. And if EC is expanding, for example, like in the hyperbolic case, then I don't ask anything that there yeah, is just one, then I, I just go exponentially, uh, I would just make exponentially close to change. So uh, this uh, is just the definition of what uh, we mean by strong stable set. And the strong stable uh, manifold theorem is that uh, these, uh, these things, which here are just sets, uh, are in fact objectively immersed uh, submanifolds, dimorphism, dimorphic to uh, essentially the R to the dimension of the stable space. They, they look like uh, ES but, uh, in terms of submanifolds, and they are tangent to ES at X. So basically, you have something like that. So for any point, X, uh, the strong stable manifold locally is going to be a submanifold tangent to ES. Uh, so there, uh, the definition may not seem canonical because uh, uh, fixed on epsilon, but in fact, as long as it's taken small enough, then all those things are going to be the same. It doesn't depend on this choice. And uh, so there, sorry, it should be lambda. But for any uh, two points in uh, your invariant set lambda, either the strong stable sets uh, are the same or they are distant. Okay, so they, they form this type of uh, foolish. And um, also, uh, there's some uh, continuous dependence on these uh, uh, stable sets with respect to uh, the point. So that's the term which you want to prove. In particular, in a public case, it gives the existence of stable relations, but uh, we can do the symmetric argument uh, going backwards. Okay, reversing times uh, stable becomes unstable, and uh, then uh, this stable manifold theorem will give you existence of unstable relations. Okay, so that's uh, that's the goal. Uh, so one uh, first uh, important uh, part is showing existence of local uh, uh, manifolds, uh, which in a slightly general, uh, more general context, when you have a dominated splitting. Okay, so they may not be exactly what you want in that case, but we explain in the end uh, how to apply this, uh, this theorem to produce our uh, stable manifolds. Okay, so let, let's look at this theorem. So it's the so-called Black family uh, theorem by Hirsch Pluchov. So in particular, it works in the Partially hyperbolic setting, okay. Also, um, uh, in situation. And uh, so here, uh, I don't assume, like previously, that you have uniform contraction along the first bundle. I just ask for uh, dominated splitting. So we have dominated splitting uh, on the points of your n variant set into E and F. It means that uh, maximal expansion along points in E is going to be less than uh, minimal uh, expansion along F, for example. Okay. So uh, then tax families give you the existence of plaques. Uh, so you have certain embeddings of the uh, E uh, space. So the, the first place is in the previous case for this is stable space, but you can embed this, this space into some, some manifold. So uh, as in the case of uh, the previous result, uh, they should be tangent to the, the the space E X uh, <clears throat> at the, the center. You have continuity, continuous dependence of these embeddings with respect to the point, and local invariance, which means that, uh, so here, here uh, in dashed 
is the embedding. But if I take a small uh, neighborhood uh, in that submanifold of X, then this small neighborhood is going to be mapped to uh, something contained in the image plaque. Okay. So it's a uh, is uh, existence of these local plaques, and um, that's what we are going to use for a stable manifold theorem. So I, I don't know. Uh, um, yeah, maybe I can start the proof. Probably I'll not finish uh, uh, during the first lecture, but I'll continue during the second one. But so, uh, uh, so let's start. So uh, the, the first thing is. Uh, so the only information uh, we have uh, in terms of domination and so on lives naturally on the tangent space. So we want to uh, to lift this um, this type of behavior to uh, something uh, living on the manifold. So for that we uh, uh, we lift f to uh, local diffeomorphisms uh, through the exponential map. So you 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 want to to look at f in exponential charts uh, in a small neighborhood. Of the origin, so that's uh, what you you do uh, near x. So you have this uh, behavior, and uh, on the complement, so you have some security region there, and on the complement, there you blow with just the differential. Okay, so uh, that's the, the the dynamics you want near x. I mean near the origin, and uh, in the the complement, essentially you replace the F with the tangent uh, dynamics. Okay, so uh, doing that, you can produce uh, a local uh, diffeomorphism of the tangent space uh, to the next tangent space, which I'm going to denote F X alpha. And uh, if you do this construction with alpha small enough, so if you localize uh, enough uh, this this thing, then uh, the the diffeomorphism which you produce is uh, arbitrarily C one closed. To the differential uh, of f, so that's one thing. Which uh, so the nice thing is that near uh, the origin it will look like f essentially, but uh, globally and it will behave like uh, the differential. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> then the, the argument uh, to produce uh, these plaques is some uh, fixed point theorem. Uh, so uh, uh, for that. Uh, so let, let's uh, consider a cone field CF along F. So F is the dominating direction. And this cone field is going to be contracted by F. So they, they are mapped uh, to uh, the inside of the cone field uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, since the other the direction E uh, is dominated, you can do the same that you, you have a cone field, but it's going to be contracted going backwards. So you take those two cone fields. And uh, so that's for, for F, but on each tangent space, uh, you just, uh, you are endowed with a constant cone field, which is uh, C uh, E of X. Okay, so you just take the, the cone field at X, and this is going to be a, a, give a cone field on the whole tangent space at X. And uh, so by the fact that uh, I mean, the cone fields uh, behave nicely, uh, uh, with respect to the differential, and by the fact that the, this diffeomorphism f hat is c one close to the f, then uh, f hat also is going to contract uh, this cone field c e uh, at f uh, to uh, c e at x. Okay, so just because we have to go uh, uh, in the yeah, just because it is very close to the f. Okay. <coughs> So um, now the space uh, uh, we want to work with to produce these plaques is a space of Lipschitz graph. So let me denote by Lx the family of Lipschitz graph tangent to the cone Cex and complement zero. So what do I mean by that? So I have this uh, cone field and. Uh, So I, I want that uh, my graph uh, psi uh, are always tangent to this cone field. So when I form the difference 
between two points on the graph, then this difference is going to produce a vector in the uh, in the country. So here uh, I, I'm doing everything in the tangent space. So the country is just this constant country C E of X. Okay. So this is the space we want to work with. And uh, it can be endowed with a distance. So just coming naturally from the deep six left, which is this distance. And um, moreover, the distance is going to be bounded by the fact that they are uniformly Lipschitz, so they, they stay in that cone, so uh, they, the, the soap is not going to, to degenerate. Okay. So you have this distance on the space of Lipschitz graph. And uh, uh, the, the first observation is to, to notice that this uh, lifted dynamics, so F hat inverse, uh, acts on the space of Lipschitz graph. So when you, you apply it, to uh, ellipsis graph uh, in LFX, then you, you are going to, to be ellipsis graph in the image X. And uh, why is it the case? So uh, let me start, stay like that. So imagine uh, you, it doesn't work well. So you have a graph and it's mapped by FX, FX hat uh, into something uh, which is not anymore a graph. So you have two points over each other. Uh, uh, so they project to the same point on the E space. Okay. So here that, that should be F minus one. Here it's X. And here is E X. So say we have two points like that. Then uh, I can look at the direction uh, uh, given by the difference between those two points. Uh, but um, <clears throat> this direction is contained in the cone field around F direction. But that cone field is, is going to be, that cone field is uh, contracted by F hat. Okay. So when we go by F hat X, uh, this should produce again two points here uh, in this. Uh, in this field, and uh, this contradicts the fact that we were uh, uh, starting with a graph uh, satisfying a tangent to C, okay? Because there I produce a direction which is in the coin field CF, okay? So is uh, and of course uh, it's going to map Lipschitz, uh, Lipschitz to Lipschitz just because the map is C1, okay? Okay, so that's um, maybe um, maybe a uh, have to stop or <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry so I, i'll stop with that and sorry maybe i'll go over the first two points uh, in the second part just to recall you but uh, thank you very much for your attention thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for your presentation um, no, yeah, yeah, just if she's yeah, it's not continuous. Yeah, in fact, um, I mean, some of the arguments I'm going to present uh, work for C1, so uh, C, C1 diffeomorphism, and just uh, just mentioning this question of regularity uh, for absolute continuity, we need C2, that is uh, one of the few places. One plus one. Yeah, one plus alpha is enough, but uh, we need more than C1, yeah, yeah. One plus alpha I think. Any other question? One quick yeah, thing. So sure. there are few continuity you really get from showing that this map that associates to each point that open by a manifold has more regularity or the argument? No, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit misleading. Uh, I mean this uh, this thing sometimes you can have very smooth leaves and uh, just transversally they may, they may be horrible. Yes, but if the map doesn't get to which point this invariant manifolds, because it's like this is continuous. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's not enough. It's not enough. Okay. Yeah. Yes. More questions? To make an analysis, this, this possibility to go from one point to another point, yeah. so it's on reliability. Yeah. If you have smooth for each. Yeah. Then you can write something in the language of Lee products. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One and vector yeah. But here you don't have two points. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. only intuition, but you need to do something. Yeah, if you have smooth collision, you can form the Lie bracket and, yeah. and you, you cannot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's essentially the same uh, um, intuitive idea that you, you you still form a quadrilaterals and you want to see if you have moved in the transverse direction. So let's send the speaker again. Um,